You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. I'm Dr. Carrie Beanett with the Fertility Center of Las Vegas, and I have my two stunningly radiant uh, co-hosts with me today, Dr. Abby Eblen of Nashville Fertility Center. Hi, everybody. And Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. How are you girls doing? I am doing so good. We're here talking today. It's always a good day when we get to podcast. I need functional advice today, please, because... This week is heinous and it's one of those things where my husband is on call what seems like every 25 minutes. <laughs> really, he's on call every other night and when he's on call, he does not come home. And so that means that when he is home, he is post-call and in that kind of exhausted, exhausted semi-functional state. And then of course, I work the hours of fertility doc, which even though they're a little bit more regular, they're kind of all the time. Still demanding. So I need to know how, what are the meals that you guys function with when you are busy? But like, we don't eat out very much because when we do, we, the entire family makes poor choices. Yes. Um, and so <laughs> we don't do, we just do not do fast food and we only go out to eat really fairly rarely. And so I'm getting tired of the same tacos and like if Costco didn't exist they we should get them to be a sponsor because like, we get those Costco's pre-prepared taco those things are good they're really good yes the tacos are good the uh, the salmon with the pesto like that's dinner tonight but I I need new ideas because otherwise yeah it's gonna be a long week so we do a lot of those like we've done hello fresh we've done green chef I was trying to think of the other one blue apron we did that one Those require a little bit of preparation, though. So that's the only thing about squealing in the door at the last minute. My husband, fortunately, has a little less demanding schedule than I do. So he can start getting things going and chopping things up. But the really nice thing about it, honestly, is it takes away the whole grocery store experience. I mean, you still have to go to the grocery store for stuff, but you don't have to go, okay, if I'm going to make this chicken dish tonight, I need this, 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 and this. It just comes one one big package and you just look at the directions, you chop it up. It's, It's like following, you know, chemistry experiment or something, you know. (laughs) <laughs> For those of us who are not cooks, you know. <laughs> At our house, because of all of my dietary restrictions, we tend not to do it. Like I would love to be able to do one of those kind of systems, but it's that's just hard. And so we have a number of go-to things that are relatively easy. So first of all, there are a million ways you can make tacos, yep. <laughs> as you mentioned, but instead of just making them like normal ground beef tacos with, you know, lettuce, tomato, cheese, those types of things. So things that we do is we will get uh, like the pre-prepared carnitas that you can get at your local grocery store. You get those and then you get that Mexican crumbly cheese and get, I get the pre-cut up cilantro just to make life even easier. Uh-huh. And we have those tacos and everybody assembles their own and everybody has fun with it. We also do um, salmon tacos. So you just stick a filet of salmon in the oven with your, you know, olive oil and whatever. That sounds good. And you cook it at 425 for 25 minutes. It'll be perfect. And then we dice up mangoes Uh and then we get a bag of coleslaw mix, the, the cabbage that's all chopped up. You put that, pour vinegar over it, cut up um, some dill, shake it up and stick it in the fridge and let it marinate for a few hours or overnight. So you can do it the night before. And then again, you just assemble the tacos together. And then wow. of course- that sounds good, Susan. I wish you'd cook for us. Can you come visit me and cook those? Those sound really good. <laughs> our, our spaghetti that we make is like super easy, but it's very, very yummy. We use uh, Johnsonville Italian sausage. And so we- Um, break that up and brown it. And then I use silver palette marinara sauce, pour it on the sausage and just like let it cook for five, 10 minutes. And then you can do, if you're doing something keto, do your zucchini noodles. My husband does keto. So he does his zucchini noodles. We do my gluten-free noodles. That's an easy one. Those are a few options, but 
you know, stick anything on a tortilla, you're good. Those are good ideas. Well, you know, for some of those food services, Susan, if you're at all interested, I'm pretty sure Green Chef has very, like, people that have this issue and that issue. You ought to look into it if you're not looking into it lately, because you might be able to get some of those meals. Yeah, I th- I think some of them do. It's, you know, another thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it saves you all that preparation time that you're talking about where you have to go to the grocery store and buy this. Because I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'd be overwhelmed by the list of, did I get this? Did I get that? The nice thing is it comes right to your door. But one thing we do is we usually only buy for like two meals at a time because we found that if you buy for more meals than that, life happens. Yeah. And you end up wasting a lot of food. Three a week is what we get. Yeah. So anyway, but those are some ideas, Carrie. I appreciate it. Thank you. The, um, I like the pasta idea that will, that will go over well in our house. Cause we don't do very, very much for that at all. And so when I do the kids, like the <laughs> eyes get as big as saucers and, and they're, they're good to go with that. It's super easy. And it, that silver palette marinara is amazing and putting it over the Italian sauce, so- broken up Italian sausage. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, when my nieces come down, they're like, Aunt Susan, are are you fixing spaghetti? (laughs) I have the Silver Palette cookbook and their apple pie recipes. And they've got like a rustic tart. Like those are to die for. They're so good. What is Silver Palette? I've never heard of that. What is that? So Silver Palette was a catering company that established somewhere on the East Coast, like the Northeast. And they, they opened a shop and they made a cookbook and... And so I happened to get the cookbook back when I was like in my late teens and I've hung on to it all these years. And some of their, some of their recipes are kind of complex, like more than I'm willing to make on a regular basis. But my, I've got a couple of diehards that come out of that cookbook that are just beautiful recipes that are crowd pleasers. My rule of thumb is if there's more than five ingredients, I don't want to make it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now that I know what I'm making for dinner this week, um, (laughs) what, what questions do we have? Okay. So our first question is going to be, I'm so glad I came across your podcast because I've learned so much about infertility and treatment options. Thank you. I'm a 38 year old unmarried virgin woman. I'm still on my search for the right person for marriage, but I know time's running out for me. So I am strongly looking into IVF. I've always been good about taking care of my health. I even have gone for my pap smear. The problem is the pap smear is so painful and uncomfortable for me. I was in tears and felt horrible and embarrassed. Is there a way to make the vaginal ultrasound testing less uncomfortable for someone like me? Yeah, I mean, I think there's ways that you can do that. I mean, sometimes we'll, sometimes I think it's, it it is truly painful if you're virginal sometimes, but sometimes I think if we help the patients kind of insert the probe, that makes it a little bit better. They feel more in control and it's not as uncomfortable and they can kind of figure out where it hurts and where it doesn't. Certainly we can use a lot of lubrication. I think lubrication is a key with everything. And if it gets really uncomfortable, it's just intolerable. And this is a little bit more extreme, but if this patient you know, really wants to do IVF, the other possibility would t- be to use dilators that you can even get those from Amazon and just start out really slow and you know have your doctor help you. It's not something you want to do on your own. But that can just gradually dilate the vaginal walls and and it can work pretty effectively, actually pretty quickly. So that might be another answer as well. And knowing that you have discomfort with a speculum exam, the ultrasound is a little bit different. So it does have a little bit different sensation. And also some offices are going to have what we consider like a normal ultrasound probe versus a 3D ultrasound probe and 3D ultrasound probes tend to be a little bit larger. And so perhaps also asking if you could have whatever ultrasound may have the smaller probe, if there is a difference within your physician's office, that can also make a difference. The other thing is that the the dilators come in in these nice unmarked boxes generally. So it's not like you have this thing showing up on your doorstep and you're advertising to everybody what you're doing. And the answer to to everything vaginal is more lubrication. And so make sure that when you go to your Amazon box and you add in the, the dilators, you put in some lubricant as well. It doesn't really matter what kind, you know, it can be KY, can be Precede, can be any, any of the the ones that you need, but more lubrication is your friend, especially as you're starting out. One last thing, if all else fails and, and I will tell you, your doctor will discourage you from doing this. We can also monitor abdominally. I mean, occasionally we've had, you know, teenagers that have come through for cancer reasons to freeze eggs and those patients a lot of times just can't tolerate a vaginal probe. And so we certainly can monitor abdominally, but it's just not as good. And it's, it's kind of like, 
trying to do what we need to do with one hand tied behind our back, but it's it's not impossible to do it that way. It's just not quite as good. So vaginal probe would be better if you can tolerate it. All right. And we're going to do one more question. Hi, I've listened to almost all of the podcasts. Thank you. At our appointment today, we found out my husband has 1% normal morphology, 11 million count, 20% motile. We are 41. I'm otherwise healthy. I start stems in September and I'm managed primarily by an army nurse at an army medical center. This will be our fourth IVF with ICSI and two FETs. None of our nine embryos implanted in 2019. I understand that if morphology isn't good, embryos grow, but implantation is reduced. And I feel like I may understand now we are doing PGT this time. Would you suggest moving forward with IVF with 1% morphology? He's not taking Clomid, et cetera, like he has once before. We do have one five-year-old sweet boy from second IVF and are hoping to give him a brother or sister. Thank you. I'm really glad that you got one baby. That's a good sign. You definitely have some uphill battles to work against. 41 and 1% morphology with 20% motility and a low count to begin with are all all big things to contend with. I think PGT is going to be really helpful in helping you to avoid futile transfers. And so one of the things that we work to do is not do a transfer that doesn't make sense to do. And PGT is a great way to sort out which embryos are never destined to make a healthy baby or, or even to make any baby. And so I think that that's going to be really helpful. I am assuming that they're doing ICSI if there's a morphology issue. So intracytoplasmic sperm injection where your embryologists are going to handpick the sperm and they're really going to cherry pick what's the most normal ones because 1% of 11 million is still a really good number to find good looking sperm that have a better chance. So, um, so I would assume that they're doing ICSI, but if not worth asking about. I mean, it sounds like they've made a number of embryos back when she was probably about 39. Mm -hmm. Um, But we all know that it, it, once you start getting into the forties, it it is substantially harder. It is substantially harder. And I, I do agree with Carrie that I think adding in the PGT is an important aspect. I think all of us here feel very strongly about that. We aren't here to get you a transfer. We're here to get you a baby. And there's a difference. There's a huge difference. And so that's really the big thing in how we are looking at things probably a little differently than it was looked at maybe even five or 10 years ago. Well, did she say how long ago she did her transfer when she had those embryos? Well, she's got a five-year-old from her second cycle. So... Right. But she had nine embryos implanted in 2019 unsuccessfully. Yeah. So I would just echo what you guys are saying about PGT. It just continually amazes me. Sometimes even with young women, we do genetic testing. And and if you were 35 back then, I would have said half of your embryos should have been genetically normal and half should have been genetically abnormal just because you're human. But, you know, maybe you're one of those people that tends to make more genetically abnormal embryos which is aside from the morphology issue. We don't know that the morphology issue plays a role really with the genetics of the embryo. And so I think by doing PGT, that will give you the best chance of having the best embryo that's hopefully genetically normal. I would also probably recommend some specific evaluation of the inside of the uterus. Implanting nine embryos that were unsuccessful, I mean, our highest likelihood is they were probably abnormal embryos but we also want to make sure that there's not something structurally wrong. That many embryos transferred, I think definitely warrant a hysteroscopy to take a look inside the uterus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So good questions today. And in looking at our topic for the day, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so actually the two out of the three of us are wearing kind of pinky tones. So I feel like we (laughs) knew inherently that we were going to discuss this. Abby's got her pink watch. (laughs) And we got a pink watch too. Um, and cute pink lipstick. And so, so today we're going to talk about fertility and breast cancer. In our world, there kind of tends to be two areas where we see breast cancer patients. One is the newly diagnosed woman where we're in this mad dash to figure out what's the best way to treat her. And then the second area is someone who's already had cancer, already been treated and is coming back after the fact. So Susan, how do you approach a woman with breast cancer that's been newly diagnosed, who's coming to see you, who's interested in fertility. Right. So first of all, these are people that we get into the clinic as soon as possible, like same day, next day. Fast pass to the clinic. Mm -hmm. Like 
tell the receptionist what you're going through. Right. Exactly. You do not stop it. Go. <laughs> you just keep on going. Exactly. So, so we get you in very quickly and it's obviously very important and it's beneficial, but I, I do know that that can also be kind of scary. Okay. And what I mean by that is these women are and just had a diagnosis of breast cancer. They um, are, you know, going through potentially having surgery, lining up their chemo and radiation, those types of things. And it's like, oh yes. And let's throw in your reproductive future. Let's throw an IVF on top let's of that. Let's throw an IVF yeah. on top of that. Sling it in. Exactly. <laughs> and so we bring them in, we do a new patient appointment, kind of make sure we understand their medical history, their gynecologic history, the, all those types of things to put as much of it together as we can in a short period of time. And Generally, we'll do a basic evaluation of ovarian function, maybe draw an AMH level or anti-mullerian hormone level because that's cycle independent, do a pelvic ultrasound, see how many follicles we have, because those things are going to give us an idea of how much medicine we need to use. We talk about what's involved in the IVF cycle now and potentially in the future, whenever you're wanting to actually use your eggs or embryos and kind of leading into that is a discussion on whether we should freeze eggs or freeze embryos. I would say now that freezing eggs is not, um, I'm totally, it's no longer experimental. It works really well. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) I was like, totally blanking on the word. Yes. So freezing eggs works really well. And so for people who, are not absolutely certain that whoever their partner is, if they have a partner um, that they want to make a child, freezing eggs is a great option. Sometimes we have patients who are in extremely committed relationships or married and they absolutely plan on having babies together. Those people, we often create embryos because the further along down the process, the kind of better idea of what you end up having. And even though freezing eggs is not experimental, It does typically take a few more eggs to yield a baby if they are frozen versus fresh. And so that all kind of goes in into some of the decision making. And so going into this, there are a couple of different organizations out there that help patients with breast cancer or other cancers get medications often for free or hugely reduced prices getting people into those systems to help cut down because obviously these women are in the midst of breast cancer. They weren't planning on this happening. You know, they don't necessarily have $10,000 just laying around um, for fertility preservation, whatever we can do to help minimize the cost is what we're helping do as part of the picture. And I think Susan touched on this too, but I think one of the biggest challenges, I think, for the person walking through the door for the patient who's just been diagnosed with this life-altering diagnosis and is having to make a ton of decisions about the treatment of the cancer and who you're going to go see and when you're going to have surgery, the hardest part is the psychological part of this. And it's, it's really difficult for us as physicians to try and present all this information in a helpful way, sometimes I really feel bad because I feel like when I'm talking to patients that have just gotten this diagnosis, it's like a deer in headlights. They're just overwhelmed when they walk through the door. And then I almost feel guilty because with all the information we have to tell the patient, it just it's even more overwhelming. So if you're out there listening, hopefully this can be a little bit more helpful for you because I think the more times you kind of hear it, the more kind of makes sense. And it's just but trying to meet the patient, get the history, talk about how we do it, teach the patient how to give medicines and get medicines ordered and literally do that in a few days time, potentially, it's just, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. When we have breast cancer patients or any cancer patients come into our clinic, we, we typically know ahead of time because fortunately most of them are really good about saying, I have this diagnosis, which definitely tell whoever you have on the phone on the other end, because that will trigger like all my staff know if you hear cancer, they're in within 24 hours. And so make sure that we we know that because once we do, like I usually have everybody lined up and ready to go so that the financial has their information, the coordinators have their information. And, and we can, if you're at the right stage in your cycle, we can usually get stuff going within 24 to 48 hours but that's a huge amount of information to load on a patient. And so um, one of the biggest questions that people ask, because breast cancer, unlike most other cancers, is hormonally sensitive. So people get really freaked out about that with good reason. Um, Abby, how do you handle 
the hormonal aspect of breast cancer combined with what we do with fertility treatment? Well, we try as much as we can to keep estrogen levels low. And, you know, as we stimulate patients with IVF cycles, kind of the goal is to give to give the, a patient that doesn't have breast cancer the hormone FSH. And FSH stimulates hopefully a whole big group of eggs to develop along and hopefully kind of along at the same rate. They kind of grow at the same time. The tricky part about breast cancer is we want to stimulate all those eggs, but we're, we really try our best to keep estrogen levels low. So a lot of times we'll pair it with a medicine called Femara or Letrozole, um, which kind of kind of keeps the estrogen levels low, but still allows the patient to stimulate. But the key is we really you know have to make sure the eggs keep continuing to grow until they're ready to be retrieved till they're mature. And so I think that's kind of one of the ways that we help keep the, the estrogen low. Do you guys have any other thoughts on that? I'm also a big fan of doing Lupron triggers for these patients because they they drop their hormones exceptionally more quickly than if they have an HCG trigger. And, you know, the last thing you want is to have a cancer patient with hyperstimulation syndrome. <laughs> That's one of the big positives too, is it keeps them from being, because many times patients are going to get their port or start chemo a few days, potentially after we end our egg retrieval. So yeah, absolutely. That's another good reason to do Lupron. I'll usually do a GNRH uh, antagonist after as well, because that will make their levels drop even faster. And it's usually just a couple days worth. It's a medication they've already been on, but that'll that'll bottom them out even faster, which, which like you said, we're trying to go for. Do we see any difference in, you, in doing a cycle with a breast cancer patient where you're running Letrozole or Fermara the entire time through it? Like, is there any functional difference in how those eggs behave or embryos behave later on down the line? I mean, overall, I don't know that we get quite as good a yield. At least that's my personal experience. Um, but I, I don't really have a lot more data on that. I tend to see more a relationship to whether or not the patient is potentially a carrier of a BRCA mutation than necessarily the stimulation medications. Um, I think there's pretty good data out there to say that it, it is harder to get good quality embryos with somebody who has BRCA as compared to somebody who does not. I mean, I occasionally use in some of my poor responders and my regular patients, I sometimes use a combination of a lower dose injectable with Clomid and Femara together. And I actually get some really nice responses. It, it, it's one of those that I had a had an outside monitoring patient that I was seeing one time and I was like, this is kind of cool. And I'm like, hmm. A lot of what we do in our field is look at what everybody else does. And if it works, we try it ourselves. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. I had a woman just this uh, last few weeks who went through a number of days of moderately high dose stimulation and I expected her to just have a ton of eggs and she wasn't doing anything, like absolutely nothing. Oh, wow. After five or six days, I had four or five millimeter follicles and I'm like, we're changing tax. And I went to this other stimulation and we ended up getting eight eggs at retrieval. I was so excited. Wow. Well, of course, the obvious thing too is age makes a huge difference. So, you know, not that we wish cancer on a 30-year-old, but the younger the patient, just like everything else we do, that makes a huge difference. If you're 40 plus versus 30, the 30-year-old's traditionally going to do better. Carrie, do you have any thoughts on whether or not you have a poor yield or any concerns when you're using Letrozole? I, I tend to see lower yields and, and you definitely do have to push out a couple extra days with letrozole compared to a non-letrozole cycle. I have seen levels like we have occasionally used that protocol in our egg donors and they do phenomenally. Hmm. And cancer patients are inherently different. The body is putting a lot more energy into other things, not making eggs <laughs> as it rightly should be. So you do see a compromised yield in cancer patients because they're their body is working on other stuff. And so I find that it's a little bit more mixed and, and the information I have going in is not nearly as predictive of what I'm going to get coming out as it would be in a patient who's not dealing with cancer at the same time. One of the things about cancer or breast cancer specifically that, you know, trying to find a silver lining here, but the one silver lining I think for patients and for physicians is a lot of times or at least in our practice, a lot of times we'll see patients right after they've had breast, they've been diagnosed, they had breast cancer surgery. And then there's about a three week window from the time they're diagnosed until they start their chemo, if, if they're going to start chemo. And so that's really the window that we have, which for us, and I'm sure you guys can, would agree with this. That's a huge window for us. You know, a lot of times we'll have somebody that comes through our door and they're like, 
they wanted to start chemo yesterday. Can you stimulate them right now and get eggs from them? And so a three week window is reasonable enough time that we can usually get somebody through a cycle and, you know, gives the patient that's going through this process a little bit more time to kind of think about things and let the dust settle a little bit and get medicines as opposed to like, we meet you today and we start you tomorrow. And of course, sometimes that happens too, depending on where you are in your cycle. But usually we have a little bit of a window there, a little bit more wiggle room usually than we do um, with other types of cancers that we see. Yeah. I also think it's important for our listeners that um, if you are struggling with breast cancer, knowing that you're not choosing your fertility over the cancer, that there's also very good published studies that taking the essentially two to three weeks we need to get all of this done, it doesn't negatively impact your long-term prognosis. Many times people worry about what the hormone levels that we achieve are going to do because even even with Femara uh, or Letrozole, you still can see higher levels. Or if you're going through just a regular cycle without the Femara or Letrozole, you're definitely going to see higher levels. It's for a very short period of time. And when you're having a normal ovulatory cycle where your egg is being produced and released, your hormone levels are going to go high. And that's normal. And that's bio, that's physiologic. That's what's supposed to happen. And so our goal is to try and keep your hormone levels during STEM about that level so that it's really at a point where it's more physiologic than above that point. Yeah. And you know, one important thing we've implied, but we've not really specifically said, so I want to make this really clear if you're listening, it's really, really important. We start your STEM before you start chemo. Even if you start chemotherapy, I had a patient several years ago who had a GI type cancer and she came to see me and she was referred by her oncologist. And she said, well, I want to freeze my eggs. And, you know, the oncologist said that this is the type of chemo that's not going to affect my egg quality. And so while I agreed with that, the problem was she had already started on the chemotherapy. And we know that for probably at least at least six months and maybe a year after you start chemo or finish chemo, actually, your eggs are just not good. It's like the ones you have, they're sort of on the launching pad, ready to be ovulated or just damaged by the chemo. And, and you know, certainly over time, you know, if, if you have a, a milder type chemotherapy, some women can recover and certainly can have children without the help of, of egg freezing, but their reproductive lifespan is a lot, lot shorter. So, you know, if you're somebody that's listening, you've had some sort of cancer, you've not frozen eggs, and now you're kind of healthy and, and you're doing well and your doctor says it's okay to get pregnant, uh, try and get pregnant sooner rather than later because your reproductive lifespan is going to be much shorter because of the chemotherapy. When we're talking with breast cancer patients, a lot of times we'll have people who have breast cancers that are going to be treated surgically and then they're going into hormonal therapy afterwards. And Susan, can you talk about a little bit of how that works and how that impacts fertility, even though the hormonal agents don't necessarily hit the eggs in the same way that other chemotherapy does? You know, it, it's one of those things that these agents are actually kind of cousins. They sure are. <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to some of the medications we use um, for fertility treatment, you know, the, the most commonly known one that we talk about is tamoxifen. And it can actually stimulate your ovaries <laughs> in some respects and stimulate the lining of the uterus and different things like that. So being aware of those effects, I guess, is the biggest thing to be aware of. And when we go through a stimulation and we're, we're trying to create eggs or embryos or trying to get you pregnant, generally, we're going to not want you on those agents at the same time because that's going to muddy the waters. And when you're on those agents, even though they don't necessarily impact your fertility, they do delay your fertility by about five years or so because that it seems like the, the most common treatment, at least these days, is you get your surgery, you go on these agents for five years and then you come off. Well, if you are 25 years old, then you'll be 30 when you come off. That is a very different story than if you're 35 when you're diagnosed and you're 40 when you come off because the difference between fertility at age 35 and 40, even though the medication itself won't necessarily impact your fertility, the time will. And so that's part of the reason why we're watching that. I've been noticing that the oncologists, especially for breast cancer patients, because used to it was generally they did not recommend trying to achieve pregnancy for five years. Mm -hmm. It seems like that window may be narrowing to around three years. Have y'all been noticing that in your patients? Yeah, Yeah. I have. 
I've seen it too. Yeah, so much so that I've even had a couple of patients that have had frozen eggs that say, well, can I try my own first and see what happens? And then if not, I'm going to use my eggs. But yeah. It's nice to see that the technology for the oncologist is improving, that they've been able to narrow that window because five years is, you know, it's a long time. Yeah, one of the breast cancer surgeons in our um, in Nashville who's been around for a long time told me that, you know, back when she started out, it was the bulk of the cancer and the nodes that were involved and all that that basically gave prognostic information. And she said, now, just like in our field, genetics has come into the breast cancer field. And it's really the genetics of the cancer, not so many how many nodes it's invaded or how big it is that really determines what the outcomes will be. And maybe maybe that plays a role in, ter- in terms of allowing women to get pregnant maybe a little bit sooner than they initially would have done. And when someone comes to you after their treatment is done, how do you, I mean, we're going to do all of the normal workup that we always do, egg levels and, and checking the uterus and all of that. But is there anything different that you do when you are planning an embryo transfer in someone or a stim in someone who's already been through all of their treatment? So I'm going to want a letter from their oncologist. <laughs> 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 well, and usually those patients are, you know, now postmenopausal or many of them are, and or some of them are. And so if they're postmenopausal, a lot of times we want to start by trying to figure out how we're going to put those embryos back. And, and like you said, get an okay from the oncologist because the hormones that we use to get people pregnant are estrogen and progesterone. Those are hormones that we worry about with breast cancer. And so I think it's important that we get clearance from their oncologist. And I usually specifically will say, this is what we're going to do. You know, do you have recommendations? Mm-hmm. But, you know, honestly, when we, you know, and people worry about that. But then when I say, well, here's the thing. Yeah, we're going to give you estrogen and progesterone now, but when you get pregnant, your estrogen and progesterone levels are going to go way higher. So we're trying to get you to a stage where your estrogen and progesterone are going to be even off the roof. And so, you know, I I think it's important for them to be able to talk to their oncologist and maybe a maternal fetal medicine specialist just to talk about, you know, their anxiety about that. Because, you know, I would certainly have anxiety about that if I'd been told for years and years, estrogen's not good for you, you know, it can make your tumor grow. It would be nerve wracking. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully this information is helpful for some of our patients who are going through this particular variety of tough time in their fertility lives um, and in life in general. Um, But thank you all for listening. Be sure to tune in next week for more. Be sure to subscribe, leave us a review in iTunes. We would love to hear from you. You can also visit fertilidocsuncensor.com to submit specific questions or ideas you'd like to hear on the podcast. All questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously for our Ask the Doc segment. So don't hold back. We'd love to hear your ideas. And as always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and it's not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right. We'll talk with you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.